Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's online service from Penrith Baptist Church. It's strange for me to be talking to a computer and not seeing the people that I'm talking to. You may be someone living in a completely different part of the world to me. Well, that's okay. Wherever you are and whoever you are, I hope that you'll be blessed by tuning in to this service, and I'd like to pray now. Would you join with me? Our Father God, we give you thanks for your steadfast love, your great faithfulness to us. Thank you for this day and for this opportunity to have this service together. And I pray that you would bless all who are tuned in to this service. Help us to give you the praise that you deserve. You are a great God and deserve our praises. And Lord, we ask that you would oversee every part of this service. And we do ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, over recent weeks, we have been looking at the minor prophets in the Bible. Last week, it was the prophet Joel. And today, we'll be looking at the prophet Obadiah. Obadiah's name means servant of the Lord. Gee, what a great name to have, servant of the Lord. Blossom is going to read the book of Obadiah, the whole book. It's only 21 verses long. And then later on in our service, Tony will be talking more about Obadiah and things that we can learn from it. Next, though, we will be having our children's song, followed by Ian giving us a children's talk. For the practice bank on this sport broadcast, let's go to camera one. Get him ready. Get him. He's got his glasses on. Get his glasses off. Yep, we're ready to go. We're going soon. Camera one ready. Standing by. Standing by. All right. Give us the call. Call. Give us the count. Call it. Give us the count. Yep. Now five and four and three and two and one. Roll tape. Have you seen those fit and healthy guys always doing their exercise? Well, it's better to work for so practice being godly Never give up, make it your aim Practice being godly If you've been forgiven in Jesus' name Practice being godly He paid the price for all our sin His Holy Spirit dwells within So center all you do on Him Practice being godly You can swim or run a train every day to be number one But it's better to train for the life to come Practice being godly Never give up, make it your aim Practice being godly If you've been forgiven in Jesus' name Practice being godly You paid the price for all our sin His Holy Spirit dwells within So center all you do on Him Say no. no, practice being godly. Never give up, make it your aim. Practice being godly. If you've been forgiven in Jesus' name, practice being godly. Pay the price for all our sin. His Holy Spirit dwells in him, so center all you do on him. Practice being godly. You gotta practice being godly. 
Prophet Obadah, Obadah's vision. This is what the Sovereign Lord says about Edom. We have heard a message from the Lord. An envoy was sent to the nations to say, Rise, let us go against her for battle. See, I will make you small among the nations. You will be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rocks and make your home on the heights, you who say to yourself, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar like the eagle and make your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. If thieves come to you, if robbers in the night, oh, what a disaster awaits you. Would they not steal only as much as they wanted? If grape pickers came to you, would they not leave a few grapes? But how Esau will be ransacked, his tre hidden treasures pillaged. All your allies will force you to the border. Your friends will deceive and overpower you. Those who eat your bread will set a trap for you, but you will not detect it. In that day, declares the Lord, will I not destroy the wise men of Edom? Those of understanding in the mountains of Esau, your warriors, Temin, will be terrified, and everyone in Esau's mountains will be cut down in the slaughter. Because of the violence against your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame, you will be destroyed forever. On the day you stood aloof while the strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. You should not gloat over your brother in the day of his misfortune, nor rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor boast so much in the day of their trouble, you should not march through the gates of my people in the day of their disaster, nor gloat over them in their calamity in the day of their disaster, nor seize their wealth in the day of their disaster. You should not wait at the crossroads to cut down their fugitives, nor hand over their survivors in the day of their trouble. The day of the Lord is near for all nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon your own head just as you drank on my holy hill, so all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and drink and be as if they had never been. But on the Mount Zion will be deliverance. It will be holy and Jacob will possess his inheritance. Jacob will be a fire and Joseph a flame. Esau will be stubble and they will set him on fire and destroy him. There will be no survivors from Esau. The Lord has spoken. People from the Negev will occupy the mountains of Esau and people from the foothills will possess the land of the Philistines. They will occupy the fields of Ephraim and Samaria and Benjamin will possess Gilead. This company of Israelite exiles who are in Canaan will possess the land as far as Zarephath. The exiles from Jerusalem who are in Sepharad will possess the towns of Negev. Deliverers will go upon Mount Zion to govern the mountains of Esau and the kingdom will be the Lord's. From the colors of fall to the fragrance.
church um, it's good to be here together today as we uh, as we think and consider the word of God the word of God which we have the the whole counsel of God consists of both the old and the New Testament the um, the whole of the scripture is to be understood as the fulfillment of Christ Jesus himself um, John's gospel tells us that the word of God is Jesus Christ who was with God from the very beginning and our Bibles are written written accounts which directs us to Jesus the word the very expression of, of God himself the Bible is not a magic book <coughs> it's in many ways quite ordinary um, we put it on the shelf we take it down from the shelf we open it it has chapters of verses we we understand that it's just almost a very ordinary book but in a very real way it is a extraordinary book like no other it is the word of god expressed to us uh, recorded for us by the 
by the community of faith over many generations. It's been preserved and kept for us. People have died so that we might have the Bible today. The Bible is not a magic book. Um, I remember this old movie, National Velvet, where the young Elizabeth Taylor uh, put a lottery ticket that she bought, um, the stub of it, into the family Bible to give her better luck for, for winning the, uh, the lottery. And we laugh at that sort of thing today, but, uh, but it's a bit like us sometimes when we open random pages to get guidance of some direction. Um, we do have to be careful because we may actually have to buy that neighbor's donkey and we really don't want to cut somebody's head off uh, or even start building the ark. Uh, imagine the uh, council of missions needed to build an ark today. When we come to the prophets, we do well to take a little time to understand who they are and what they're saying, what they were talking about, before we try to understand what it means to us today. And we've been going through the those Old Testament prophets, the minor prophets, those who have been a name, um, in a book in the back of the Old Testament. And... Uh, it's not often that uh, you might hear a sermon preached on Obadiah. Well, it's the shortest book in the Old Testament, <clears throat> but it's not very commonly preached. And when looking at the prophets and the writings like Obadiah, uh, there are some questions which you've been asking. Who was the prophet? What did he have to say? Why did he need to say it? And was there any word of hope in the future? And why is it important for us today? So who was this prophet? Well, that can be easily and quickly uh, um, answered. Uh, we don't know. Um, Obadiah remains a mystery to us uh, almost two and a half thousand years later, except that we know that he was identified as a prophet. Um, and we understand what his name means. Um, like many of the prophets, the names had significance. Uh, and Obadiah means one who serves Yahweh. What do we have to say? Um, Obadiah's prophecy deals with this ill feeling between two nations, between Judah and Edom, a relationship which went back centuries. Um, some conflicts can only be understood if we understand history. Um, I remember when my daughters were quite young, uh, in our family discussions, we, we spoke about the IRA, the Irish Republic Army, Republican Army. One of my asked, girls asked, uh, who were they? Uh, I mean, to understand that properly, you have to go back quite a long way in the Irish-English history. To understand problems that we face today amongst the Indigenous people, we, we have to go back uh, centuries to the coming together of the white and black people. Um, and it probably goes to that moment of the beach where, where the, the landing and within 15 minutes of the beach, the English did fire uh, their first shot. To understand the ill feeling between Islam and, and Christianity, um, you need to go back a thousand years to understand what happened in the Crusades. And to understand Obadiah's message, we have to go back about a thousand years before he said it. Most of us know the story of Abraham, who was the father of Isaac, and Isaac had two sons, and their sons was his sons was called Esau and Jacob. And Jacob was a, a deceitful sort of guy and tricked Esau out of his birthright. Um, they were twins, but Esau was the oldest. And, and the blessing that was to come to the older was given to Esau, uh, from, from Esau to, to Jacob. Both of these uh, men had great clans, great families. Uh, then they had great nations. And, and Jacob became the, nation, the, uh, became the founder of the nation of Israel. And Esau was the, from the nation of Edom. Now, Edom was uh, down the south, uh, across the Dead Sea uh, from Judah. Um, the destruction that came from the north, we've been talking about um, Assyria or, um, uh, or Babylon, how it comes, they come down and they, they saw, we saw how the northern tribes, the ten tribes of, of Israel, were completely wiped out. Um, they were completely gone by Nineveh uh, and the Assyrians uh, in 722 BC. And the northern nation of Israel was no longer. 
And the, then what, what was next on the agenda was the southern na nation of Judah. Ninety years later, Nineveh was destroyed by Babylon. Uh, we see superpowers rise and superpowers fall. Um, and Babylon was growing with greater influence. And, and seven years later, uh, Babylon rules, uh, rules over Jerusalem. Um, that's the time of Daniel being taken into Babylon to try and educate. So we're talking about uh, 605 BC. And it's only eight years later in, in 597 BC that Israel, uh, J Jerusalem rebels against the, the overlord, the Babylon, and the, the place is flattened, the exiles were taken into Babylon, those who survived. The prophets in Jerusalem argued, really, every time that it was finally God's judgment had, had been dealt with, uh, God had come and taken into exile those who were the evil ones. And so we are now the pure remnant. We are the ones who have been uh, blessed by God and those evil people have gone. But of course, Jeremiah's message was completely different. Um, and, and he said they are the remnant that God was going to keep for future, future generations. Why do you think the old brother nation of Edom uh, was doing, doing, what were they doing when this was happening, when, when Babylon come down and uh, flatten Jerusalem? Well, we read, we read that in uh, verse 10. Because of the violence against your brother Jacob, you'll be covered with shame. You'll be destroyed forever. On the day you stood aloof, while strangers carried off wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. You should, you should not look down on your brother on the day of misfortune, not rejoice over the, the people of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor boast so much in the day of their trouble. You should not march through the gates of my people in the day of disaster, nor look down upon them in the day of calamity, in the, in the day of destruction, nor seize their wealth in the day of disaster. Do you see what was happening? Um, uh, when the Israelites were being massacred, they were being destroyed. Edom, they don't... They not only did nothing but cheer on the Babylonians, but they actually set out to bring harm to those who were trying to escape, those who were refugees. And so God's judgment was upon them. So why did Obadiah need to say this? Um, well, Obadiah was probably nowhere near Eden when he preached this. Um, the prophecy was really not for them as much as it was for those who were in captive. It would have served to encourage the people of God in exile that God had not forgotten their sufferings. God was not a God uh, that was distance. God was a God of justice too, and their sufferings will not be forgotten. Actually, Eden were, were mountain people, um, and their pride and their arrogance uh, from those dizzy heights found them in this lofty location where they could easily defend themselves against invaders. And we see that in verse uh, 3 and 4. The pride of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the, the clefts of the rocks and make your home in the heights. You who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? Though you soar like the eagle and make your nest among the stars, from where I, from where I will bring you down, declares the Lord. The message for, was for God's people. It was to, to communicate to them that they did not have to worry about their enemies, that, that God was going to deal with it. It was, it was a recognition that God was indeed with them, even in their sufferings. God was there. He's not distance, distant from them. He was with them in the valley of the shadow of death, as we remembered in Psalm 23 recently. God is present in our sufferings. And that's a pretty significant thing for us to remember it today, isn't it? That God is with us even in our sufferings. We want God, of course, to save us from our sufferings, to, to give us a perfect life, but it's, it's so much more significant than that. God will actually be with us in the sufferings. But why is this important today? There is a, 
a message of destruction against Edom for, the, for their part. So is this just a good moral? Um, is it sort of like, could I simply say, he who lasts, lasts, lasts longest? And that's the moral of the story. I don't think so. The books that we have in the Bible here are not just historical accounts of what happened. They are a, they are a map for us to understand the common themes of the, of the scriptures that we can see in our lives today. That we can see here rival factions that go back to right not just to, to Abraham, to Isaac and Jacob, but to Genesis 3. Where after the fall, God identifies a rivalry between the woman's seed, Eve's seed, and the seed of the serpent. Between those who represent the image of God and the rule of God, and those who would love to plunge the, the creation in the depths of evil, the evil of humanity. Here we see an evil in action. Edom represents all these evils, taking the opportunity to destroy and to take advantage and cause more suffering which we see so often in our world today. The rivalry between these two goes back to Esau and Jacob, where Edom represents that path of evil. It does not matter how high and mighty or powerful uh, these forces of evil are, God will bring them down. God will deal with them, and that's the confidence that we can have. We should not overlook verse 15 from this passage. Um, it is because this, this verse is not just for Edom, the, the, the nation that is evil, but all the nations. Uh, verse 15, the day of the Lord is near for all nations. That, that day where God will bring judgment is near for, not just for Edom, but for all nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your deeds will be returned upon your head. These categories of um, these rivalries, these themes, help us recognise Jesus, our Saviour. In the New Testament, we see Jesus as the true and the better Israel. And Babylon, uh, uh, the, uh, the forces of evil in the, in the world, want to bring down Jesus. Uh, Jesus, who was sinless, who bore the, the punishment of the world for their sins, and did so willingly to show the world, the love of the mercy of the Father, was working in competition. Um, a, there was this rivalry between the forces of evil who would, who want to bring down anything of God. But Jesus, who died for the, for the sins of the, the earth, uh, for the world, um, death on the cross, for his, not his own sins like Israel did when they went into Babylon, but he, Jesus bore the sins of the whole world. He, had, he was sinless himself, but he bore the sins of others. So in verse 11 again, On the day you stood aloof, while strangers carried off wealth, and foreigners entered in gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like them, that's what the passage says. When Jesus bore the grace and dignity, when he was nailed under the tree, did he, did he not bear the, the consequences of the sins of the world while the other nations carried off even his meagre possessions, casting lots for a tunic? Who, and, and who we see looking on and jeering? Israel itself takes the role of Eden. Israel is the one who is calling for the death of this Messiah. As humanity rebels against the rightful heir, the king's son, the seed of the woman is struck, but also the seed of the serpent seeks to deliver that final bite. But they did not understand that humanity was going to lose. But they did not understand that the humiliation, the beatings, the mocking, the, the crown of thorns that was meant to, to bring harm or to dehumanise, to, to bring down, actually raised Jesus up before the whole world and he was presented as, as the true king of the world. The lamb was that was slain will be worshipped. 
After the resurrection, Jesus spoke to his disciples about how the prophets spoke about him. Can you imagine him getting to Obadiah? And finally, the disciples, cling, 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 the light comes on. Finally, I understood Obadiah. It is my understanding that Obadiah was proclaiming this message after the destruction of Jerusalem in 587 BC. Edom was not spared. Uh, the Babylonian destruction kept going south, and 34 years later, Edom was completely destroyed. Even though Jerusalem was destroyed at the time too, Obadiah could say, verse 17, but on Mount Zion will be deliverance. It will be holy, and the house of Jacob will possess its, possess its inheritance. It's a bold statement for Obadiah to say, Mount Zion, the, the holy place, will be delivered after it has been destroyed already. See, Zion is the is the place, the very centre, it was the very centre of Jerusalem, made on, on that mountain top, um, where the, the, the temple of God was there. The, the, the temple was the meeting place of heaven and earth. The, the temple was where God and humans met. And that's why Zion was indeed so special. If Zion was the place where God dwells, Jesus can be understood to be the true and the better Zion, where the reign of the offspring of David, King David, can continue for all eternity. Zion was ultimately delivered when Jesus rose from the grave to display his glory and the power of the true Son of God, proving that he was God. So, do you need a temple today? Should we go to the temple? If the temple is a place where God and humanity dwell, if it is the meeting place of heaven and earth, where do we go for that to happen? It's certainly not a church building. It is us. We are the dwelling place of the Most High. Heaven and earth meet in the followers of Jesus Christ. We are the, the true temple of God. The message to Edom or to anyone who works against what God is doing in the world, be warned. Don't scoff, don't, don't ridicule, don't be indifferent to God. Deliverance is only found in Jesus. To be, a, to, to be indifferent to Jesus means that you are outside that salvation plan. So my strongest encouragement for anyone here is to accept the plan provided by our Lord Jesus Christ, the risen Lord, and accept him as Lord. Even this is last week, I had a phone call from a person who's seeking to show love and care to another human being, you know, and yet is finding it so hard because they're, they're only being met with, um, with hurt and harm. And I just commended her because she's actually doing exactly what Jesus did. And we too are called to act in this way. This is the message we share today and every day. God is love. And you know, and you can know that God today. So let me encourage you, don't be proud. Don't be arrogant. Don't work against the purposes and plans of God. Today is the day of your salvation. And let me just encourage you to grab it with both hands. So let's pray. And Father, today is the day of our salvation. Lord, for anyone who does not know Jesus as Lord, have the opportunity right now to say yes to Jesus, and we pray for those people. Lord, Lord help them say yes to Jesus. Open their eyes to see Jesus, the, the, the Lamb who was slain, is bringing salvation. And... In, in all his glory, we'll, we'll see him once again in the second coming. I want to pray for us who have been on this journey for a while as we say yes to Jesus again and again every day. Lord, we discover something more of our salvation. We realise our, not, not so much our eternal salvation, but salvation from doing foolishness and acting fooli foolishly in life to, to bring harm to others. Lord, we don't want to be arrogant. We don't want to be hard-hearted. 
So we pray, Lord, that through your Spirit you continue to transform us. Indeed, today is the day of our salvation for everyone. As we say yes to Jesus, and we say no to the things that would um, call us back and deceive us and uh, try to win us over. Lord, we just thank you for the, the wonderful truth that Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, calls us to follow him in humility, in obedience, in suffering, and in sacrifice. Father, may we take those steps of faith in whatever area you're calling us to come. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer, our sovereign Lord and our heavenly Father. We come into your presence this morning, acknowledging that you are never far from us and that when we seek you, we will find you when we seek you with all our heart. At the same time, we are humbled by your greatness and your goodness. As Moses fell on his face when you passed in front of him in your glory, so too do we ask for an attitude of worship today that is a fitting response to our encounter with the living God. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, you have a plan for each of us, just as you hold all creation in your hands. At times it is hard to see a way forward in a world that we know is groaning, awaiting the renewal that you will one day bring. We think of those in our families and in our church family who are sick and suffering from disease and physical pain. We think of those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. We think of those who are struggling with mental illness or with the challenges of being alone. We lift up their names to you now in the silence. Lord, you know each one of us. When you walked on earth, you healed the sick and cast out demons, healing as many as came to you. We ask for your healing now. We pray for our nation and the city of Penrith as we face the ongoing challenge of coronavirus. We pray that you would reach out your hand and stop the spread of this disease. We pray for wise leadership as governments, organisations and individuals balance the need to go about our lives with the need to care for the vulnerable in our communities. We pray for those who, whether due to sickness, poverty or living situation, are particularly at risk. We pray that we would not succumb to the temptation of fear, as we have not been given the spirit of fear, but of love. Help us not to shut ourselves off from others, just as you, Lord, have not shut us out of your mercy. Be with us as a church as we seek your will for us in the future. Bless our efforts to be the body of Christ to each other and the people of Penrith. We pray the process of seeking a new minister for our church. We ask you to lead so that we might follow. We bring before you our elders and deacons as they too lead us over this period of transition. Keep them grounded in your word and in the daily habits of prayer and finding instruction in your word. For each one of us, I ask that you would enable us to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Give us this day our daily bread. Lord, you know all of our needs before we even open our mouths. Nevertheless, we ask for your provision, trusting that as we who are evil give good gifts to our children, how much more will our Heavenly Father give good things to those who ask him? We bring before you particularly those whose work and finances have been affected by the restrictions due to the virus this year. We ask that you give us what we need, neither too much lest we forget you, nor too little lest we become desperate and disheartened. And forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Lord, we acknowledge our wrongdoing, our sin, for the times that we have broken faith with you, Relying on ourselves and neglecting your ways for our lives, we say sorry. Give us a heart of repentance, a desire to turn back from our selfish desires and towards you, the God who welcomes sinners and makes them holy. We thank you that in Christ we stand forgiven, that our sins are covered by the precious blood of Jesus, freely shed for us. As you in Christ forgave us, we ask for the grace to forgive others even when the world would tell us that we are right to act out of bitterness or spite. May this be particularly evident in our families, where we first learn and most often practice the reconciliation that has been purchased for us in Christ. Let our dealings with those in our workplaces and communities be shaped by an overflowing of the gracious forgiveness that you've poured out so abundantly in our own lives. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Keep us grafted to you, the true vine. Remind us of who you are as we experience your sustaining power day by day. 
Fill us with the joy and hope that comes from knowing you. Make us see the devil's lies enticing us to seek pleasure and fulfilment apart from you for the hollow sham that they are. As we are a new creation in Christ, we delight in you and in your righteousness and not in the darkness in which we once walked. Be our light, Lord Jesus, today and forever. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory. Amen. Yeah. 